Greetings again, everybody. Now's the best part of the service. Uh, not because you get to hear me talk, but you get to hear the word of God through this broken and flawed vessel. So who's ready for some good preaching? Amen. Amen. All right. So, you know, this is the part five of the sermon series, uh, Why Should I Attend Church? And I'll probably bring this sermon series back a little later on, but let's be the last one uh, for now. You know, we should attend church, for one. Uh, God did not tell us to attend church at the honky-tonk bar for praise and worship. <laughs> Unless you think that bar is a the church of the living God and can represent the truth of his word. Don't worry, I assure you, uh, a dive bar, a honky-tonk bar, is not a possibility. If this were true, my dad would have hardly missed a day of church. And the standard of Christian behavior would be would be pretty low. But just in case some Christian got the wild idea like that, Paul the Apostle, he went ahead and he set some ground rules for some practical behavior inside and outside the church for us Christians. First Timothy states, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth by common confession. Great is the mystery of godliness. He who, who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Let us pray. Father God, you guided me in preparation. I ask that you use this broken and flawed vessel to declare your truths. May you guide me in presentation. May I do everything to bring glory and honor to your name. Amen. So most of us are familiar with Hank Williams and some of the timeless songs that Hank Williams wrote. Among some of these hit songs he wrote, he wrote, Your Cheating Heart, Hey Good Looking, I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry, and he wrote Honky Tonk. You know, that's a, that's a funny word. I tried to look up where we got the word honky tonk from. We really don't know where it came from. There's so many different ideas of where the word came from that it basically is just a nice word for a, a hole in the wall dive bar, a low and kind of dirty and a hole in the wall bar. You know, however, Hank, he did write some gospel songs, which we know, such as I Saw the Light and Calling You. I don't know if you heard Calling You. That's also a really good song that he wrote. Calling You remains one of Williams' most effective gospel compositions. Although it's hard to recognize Hank Williams as a Christian, especially in contrast of his reckless lifestyle. Even though Hank Williams, he, un, you know, he unfailingly displayed passion when he sang those spiritual songs. His life was overshadowed by alcoholism, his reckless lifestyle, on top of drug addiction. And sadly, Hank Williams, you know, he died at the age of 29. He wrote all those songs in a short period of time, and he died that young. And most people remember him for his hit songs. They remember him how he died. He died, he died struggling. He died struggling as, as an alcoholic with prescription pain pills, struggling to you know, try to save his marriage and try to get his life right. But I try to imagine what Hank Williams could have done if he gave up that lifestyle, if he gave up the drugs and the alcohol and the sin what if he devoted his life to striving to being like Jesus? Because when he saw the light, he not only saw the light, he listened to God, and he followed the call that Jesus put in him. If Hank wanted to be a faithful Christian, though, there would be no more honky-talking, drinking, drugging, chasing women, and all, all of the above in a sinful lifestyle. In order to follow Jesus, like any other Christian, Hank would have to behave himself. He'd have to stay out of his old habits. Couldn't go back to that lifestyle. 
So instead of going to a honky-tonk bar, Hank would have to find himself a church. Then his son, Hank Williams Jr., he might have changed, he might have changed the words to a country boy can survive. That's why I titled this message, A Southern Baptist Can Survive. It went well. So I don't know if y'all heard the song, Country Boy Can't Survive. It's because I got a shotgun. You can put a Bible, a four-wheel drive, and a Southern Baptist can survive. Said Country Boy. Anyways, I thought it was funny. So since the 1700s, 1st and 2nd uh, Timothy and Titus have been called the pastoral epistles. The letters contain practical suggestions on how to care for the sheep of the flock. 1st Timothy was the first of the pastoral epistles uh, to be written, with Titus soon after, then 2nd Timothy right before Paul's death. If Paul was released from uh, house arrest in 61 AD, this would allow excuse me, for his travels, this letter, this letter was probably written around 64, 66 AD. The theme of 1 Timothy is more important. It's set forth clearly in verses 14 and 15 in book 3. It says how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Paul states here quite simply that there is a standard of behavior in the church in our life as Christians too. And Paul wanted to enable Timothy, and he wants to enable us today to know what that behavior is. Conduct is just another word for behavior. The Greek lexicon uh, translates this to mean how one walks in their life, how they behave morally, and uh, their, their overall character. You know, it's not enough church to say to a child who's misbehaving Behave yourself when they don't know what they're doing wrong. Child doesn't know what to expect in the way of good, good behavior, then they won't recognize what good behavior is. Paul recognized the possibility of being delayed and you know, or even not being able to make it to Ephesus. In fact, we don't know if he made it to Ephesus at all. But he remained, if he remained long, he wanted Timothy to know how believers ought to conduct themselves in the household of God. Therefore, Paul would have us understand today that we Christians should conduct ourselves as people who belong to God's household. We conduct ourselves as people who are part of a church of the living God, as people who belong to the pillar and ground of truth. We must behave ourselves, in short, accordingly. In the preceding verses before today's text, Paul described how bishops, deacons, and their wives ought to behave themselves. Now he explains how a Christian in general should behave in the house of God. The house of God is defined as the church of the living God. And to further define that, we talked about that in Sunday school, the church is also within us. That's the Holy Spirit. God's within us, Jesus. Now uh, he explains uh, that we should behave ourselves in the house of God. A pillar church in the text was not only used to support its structure, but often a pillar was used to set up in a public marketplace where notices were posted on. Therefore, a pillar was also a proclaimer, and it still is today. The church is a unit on earth which God has chosen to proclaim and display his truth. So when Paul says in the text, the mystery of godliness is great, he doesn't mean that it's very mysterious. What does Paul mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Paul is saying that the previously unknown truth concerning the person and work of the Lord Jesus is very marvelous. And Jesus is very wonderful. And great is the mystery of being like him. Christianity itself is a mystery, a mystery that cannot be found by reason our human intellect, our light of nature. Because it's above that. It's above reason. It is a mystery not of philosophy or speculation, but of godliness, designed to promote godliness. Godliness is godlikeness. These are the characteristics and traits that are described of God. So what am I saying, church? God wants us to be like him. 
Jesus wants us to be like him. God created us for a purpose. He created you, Brother Robin, for a purpose. He created you, Sister Patricia, for a purpose. And that's to be like him. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to be like him so when people look at you, they understand who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about. They can say, look, that guy over there, that guy, gal over there, that's a Christian. They're the real deal. They're not at the honky-tonk bar. They're not at the dive bar. They're serving the community. They're helping others. They're loving others. They live it out. We live it out. We shine and we show Jesus Christ through us. That's what God wants. He wants us to be like him so we can experience the joy and that we can bring the joy of Jesus Christ to others. Sometimes church, get this. Sometimes all people will understand about God is through you. Because they won't pick up a Bible. They went into a church a long time ago and they got a bad taste in their mouth. So they went to the honky-tonk bar and they sit in the dive bar because they got a bad experience. So sometimes all they see is that person. And that's how God uses you to communicate to others, to lead others to Jesus Christ. And that's what we're supposed to do, right? Don't y'all read that mission statement when you walk in, walk in through here? That's our mission statement. We are supposed to equip others in the ministry. We're supposed to lead others to Jesus Christ. That's our job as Christians. And it's not a job that we should, I, I don't know if I should even call it a job. It's, 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 it's a passion, something that we would want to do because the Holy Spirit inside us and changes us and transforms us to the point where we want to be, put me in, coach. I preached a sermon on that way back, way back. I said, put me in, put me in the game. I want, to, I want to serve God. I want to do this. So as Christians, though, we have a standard which we must live by. And for pastors, we have an even tighter standard. Oh, boy. I'm taking a, I'm taking a class on supervised ministry uh, this semester. Andy, I don't know if y'all remember Andy. He was from uh, Pastor Andy. He uh, gave a sermon on revival in the live feed. And I told Andy, I was like, wow. I read these, these books, and I'm, 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 I'm kind of scared. He said, well, that's good. You're supposed to be. That's the point of the class, and you're supposed to, be, you're supposed to realize how serious this is. But you guys, I think, should, I think we should all think like that. Even though we're not pastors, we should all strive to be this, this serious about, 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 about the ministry, about being Christians. That's what we do. So it's okay to... See your pastor at the butter churn, but you shouldn't see him at the at the dive bar, or the honky tonk. I've been using that a lot lately. Do we have any of those around here? What do they have in the English side? Yeah. Just checking. Y'all shouldn't know about that. So <laughs> I'll just mess it with y'all. So inside the church and outside, we should we should behave ourselves. We should act like Christians. Especially outside. Especially outside. You know, Satan, he surely, he surely seeks to trap believers, doesn't he? You know, it's a very sad thing when you see a, a servant of God being trapped by the enemy. We talked about that in, in Sunday school. When you see someone just get carried away and just drown, drowning in sin. And I was talking about this in Sunday school with Brother Robert. He gets a great, he gets a great, great Sunday school lesson, by the way. And, you know, sin, whenever... A Christian goes into sin, starts committing sin for the first time. Well, they know they know the sin is bad. Well, it feels bad. They say, "Well, I I feel really bad committing this sin." But then what happens is, if they don't change the cycle and they keep committing the same sin and sin, because we're going to sin no matter what. But that's not your get out of jail free card. When we sin, we're supposed to feel bad about it. We're supposed to repent. We're supposed to not commit that sin again. At least try not to. But if we keep committing that sin, it starts feeling, well, it doesn't feel bad anymore. It starts feeling kind of good. And then we get further and further and further away from God. 
I said it's kind of like working out. Whenever you uh, you work out for the first time, right, Brother Shane, you, you work out, and that first workout, it's been a while, it, it hurts, it stings, right? But then after a while, that workout doesn't hurt anymore. And that's what sin does to us. Also, the manner of life that we live, church, we must do it so it doesn't bring blame not to ourselves, but blame to Jesus or the gospel of Christ. We have to have a good reputation inside and outside the church. Remember this, church. I think that Satan, the problem, of course, is that Satan, I think, he works harder on those who have a greater influence than those that have lesser influence. So remember that the more the Lord uses you, church, the greater the temptations are, the more the attacks are going to come. The enemy will come in your path. And I've always, I've always said this, you know, if the devil's not attacking you and you're a Christian, if he's not attacking you, then you might not be doing something right. If you're attacking, if he's attacking you, then you're probably doing something right. Because you're a threat. You're a threat to his kingdom. But we want to make sure when we grow ourselves up spiritually that we want to be like an oak tree. We don't want to be like a tree that knocks over. We want to be a strong oak tree that Satan's not going to knock us over. We develop this through each other. We develop this through our church attendance with each other. It's not that I just going to go, I got to come to church, right? Well, no, we want to come to church. We want to fellowship. We want to grow with each other. God talks to us. He uses us. That's how we communicate. That's how God communicates. But God wants us to be like him. That's his purpose for creating you. And he created us to be like him. He made us in his image and after his likeness. It's a purpose of God that we be like him. What is God like? I'm glad you asked. A lot of things. God is love. God wants us to love and dominate our being. God is pure. God is holy. He wants us to be pure. He wants us to be holy. God is kind. God is compassionate. And God is patient. He wants us to be kind. He wants us to be compassionate. He wants us to be patient. The mystery of being like God, church, is not a mystery. It's been revealed. It's through his son, Jesus. It's a great mystery that's been solved. It was answered in the incarnation. God solved the mystery through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The mystery of godliness is revealed through Jesus Christ. God was manifest in the flesh, church. He was manifest in the, in the flesh, right? What, is this, what does this mean? This is the big deal. It's plain, it's clear, it's positive. It's a declaration that Jesus Christ is God. The purpose of the incarnation was also to bring believers like you and I to Christ's likeness. Or at least help us get there, right? The Spirit led Jesus in the wilderness. He was tempted by the devil, and he passed every test with flying colors. Jesus resisted temptation. Jesus remained true and obedient unto the principles of God. Jesus was justified, approved to be righteous in the Spirit. The text in the day, in the day's uh, text in Timothy, says he was seen of the angels. After his temptation, the angels came and they ministered unto him. It's also suggested that the angels might have never seen God until the incarnation. I'll have to dig deeper on that. But God dwells in a light, church. Okay, get this, all right? Lean in closely for this. God dwells in a light that a man cannot approach. Those who had visions of God, remember, they never had a vision of, of a form necessarily. There's always just a brightness about God, right? A glory that shown he was so bright. Remember the Old Testament days, right? God was almost nuclear. He was just so bright and powerful that if you looked at, looked at him, you, you would have a beard or 
go blind. He was just so much light, such a glorious light. Looking directly into light, he was a brilliant light, though. And just like Hank, we can say, I saw the light. Have you ever been in the woods at night? You ever been in the woods, you ever go camping at night? Or uh, work on a car at night? Or get the police, and the police, they, they flash those big old lights. We all never had that happen, but police, they, they come in there with those big old mad, mad lights, those strong, real strong lights. Those, they, they, they hurt your eyes. I remember working on a car one night, one of my friends, he pointed one of those, those big old heavy duty mag lights, I think he called it a tactical light, or like five sails. He shined that in my light, my eyes. All you can see is that bright light in your eyes, right? It's blinding. You don't see the flashlight, so here's my pen, right? Here's the flashlight shining. You don't see the flashlight. You don't see the person's face shining in the light. You can't see the bulb in the light. You can't see the little filament. All you see is a bright light. The God's presence is an overwhelming light, church, a greatness. Christ has been proclaimed among nations. From the day of Pentecost onward, Christ has been proclaimed among nations. This proclamation has not only reached the Jewish people, but the farthest corners of the earth. This is the great mystery of godliness that Christ was offered to the Gentiles. He was a redeemer. He is a redeemer. He's a savior. Whereas before, the idea of salvation of the Jewish people was, it was, it was only solely to them. But the partition wall had been taken down. The Gentiles were taken in. And guess what? Where are the Gentiles? The rest of the world, we were taken in. Acts, uh, Acts 13, 47 states, I have placed you, us, believers, as a light. As Paul tells King Agrippa concerning his Damascus Road experience, he tells them that the Lord had called him unto the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of evil to good, from the power of Satan to God. And in Christ's church, he was believed on in the world. So all over the world, those who believe in Jesus Christ can receive him. And sadly, Jesus didn't get the reception he deserved. Did he? Then it says Christ was taken up in the glory. He said, I came to the, from the Father, I'm going to the, to the Father. In his return to the Father, the cycle was complete. His ministry was accomplished. Jesus came to manifest man what God is, to, man, to manifest, manifest to man what God is, who God is. And he was a true and faithful witness. All that we need to do, all that we need to know about God, church, all that we need to know about God, we discover in Jesus Christ. So I conclude this message. Jesus fulfilled his purpose in manifesting God to us. And he fulfilled the purpose of redeeming the world back to God through his death upon the cross. So now, when Jesus returns, or as he returns to the, to the Father, he is promising that he is going to send the Holy Spirit. And he did. One who would come alongside us and help us. John 14, 16. I want to show this. I said I'm fixing to land the plane, but I want to show you this verse right here. I love this verse. It says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and he'll be with you. Isn't that awesome? Like I said, I'm fixing to land the plane. Uh, he tells us that when the Spirit uh, comes, we'll receive power. What kind of power? Glad you asked that also. The power to be like Jesus. 
But here's the kicker. Here's the kicker, church. We cannot be like Jesus. Even with our best effort, we cannot be like Jesus. No matter how hard we try, we can't be like Jesus. Because, church, why did I say that? It isn't in our nature to be God, to be like God. But we can be like God. We can be like him. The only way we can be like Jesus is through the power of him, which is through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the paradox. That's the answer. We can't do it ourselves. The Spirit works in you. It works in us. And it can transform us. The sin of the Holy Spirit upon the church was proof that Jesus had indeed ascended to the Father. Because that was his promise when he came to the Father. He was going to send the Helper. Jesus sent the Helper who was the Holy Spirit. And through the power and the working of the Holy Spirit within our life, God-likeness is now possible. The work of the Holy Spirit in us every day is making us a little bit more like Jesus. Who here wants to be a little bit more like Jesus? Oh yeah, I know I do. So as the Apostle Paul said, we've got one more verse up there. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made, made it my own. But one more thing, the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God and Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. A prize, right? When I tell Ben, I tell baby Ben, you get a prize, right? I'm excited, right? I love how I use the text. I like the word prize. So what's the, what's the prize? The prize is being like God. Christ likeness is God likeness. And we're on our way. We're on our way there. And as John said, we are now sons of God. It doesn't appear yet, it doesn't yet appear that we're going to be what we're going to be. But we know when he appears, when Jesus appears, we're going to be like him. So one of these days, church, one of these days, wasn't there an old show, an old TV show or something? One of these days, right? I'm trying to remember what show that was. I'm sorry, train, lost the train of thought there. Uh, let me finish. Okay, one of these days, his work, God's work, will be complete in us. And we will be just like God. And the purpose of God will now be accomplished in his creation of us. For God created us to be like him through Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit, it restores us to the image of God. Great is the mystery of being like God. Great is the mystery which is revealed of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for everything that you do in us and through us. We thank you for the gift, the prize of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the fellowship we have. We thank you for a nation that allows us to, to have worship in your name. We ask that we find and seek ways to further expand your kingdom, to help others turn to Jesus Christ, to turn away from evil, and to expand your kingdom. We ask that you continue to bless Bethel Baptist Church, guide this church in your direction. We seek you, Father God, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I dare not end a sermon without offering a lifeline. Uh, so today's the day. Today's your lucky day, right? So if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, make a profession of faith today because tomorrow is not promised. I think everybody here in this room, is, everybody's saved, right? Raise your hand. Everybody know Jesus? Okay. So y'all folks, amen, amen, amen. Um, but if you don't know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, make a profession of faith today because tomorrow is not promised. Only death is. You can come up now or you can make a profession of faith on this feed, on a live feed. 
We'll be there to receive you. I'll be down there to receive you. So if you have a special prayer to uh, church, I think we brought in some prayer requests, but you've got any, uh, any, any concerns right now or anything that's on your heart, please come up uh, at this time or during our, our invitational hymn. Let us pray with you. Same folks on the feed too. I'll, I'll get you a 